Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, on the webinar today that UCAS is um, giving one of our demystifying webinars. Um, today, we're looking at the purpose of accreditation. Um, as you can see from the screen, microphones are not going to be enabled during the webinar. Um, we are running a Q&A session, which will be held at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you have questions that you'd like to submit for that, please do that throughout the presentation and at the end in the Q&A box rather than the chat. Um, the webinar is being recorded and I will be sending that round by email next week. So you will get a copy of the recording. Um, please, it's best if you don't use the chat um, as the questions will get recorded then and we can make sure we get through them all. Um, so please use the Q&A function for that instead. Um, I'm going to hand you over now to my colleague, Crystal Smith. Um, Crystal's the accreditation specialist in the development section, and she's going to go through everything on the webinar today and give you a really good overview of um, really why, why UCAS exists, what we do um, and how we can potentially help. So over to you, Crystal. Thanks ever so much, Laura. Um, right. So obviously the, the talk and the presentation here to listen to today is demystifying the purpose of accreditation. Um, the aim is that we we'll provide information from ourselves that obviously helps you understand why accreditation exists and how organisations may go about obtaining accreditation. Um, hopefully the information will be in, in, of interest to people who are employed by an accredited organisation, um, but maybe not directly involved in the accreditation process. So hopefully it'll give a bit more information and a bit of background information about what accreditation means and why it's so important. Um, as Laura said, my name is Crystal Smith and I'm accreditation specialist within development. Um, development section that looks at new areas of accreditation, of potential accreditation, um, whether the area and um, the, the market would benefit from accreditation in that sector. Um, and just kind of seeing what's out there and what people's needs are and responding to those. Um, before I um, was in development, I worked in the healthcare section of UCAS for the last eight years as an accreditation manager, um, accrediting people at 15189. So the contents, uh, what we're looking to get through today um, is who UCAS is, what's the purpose of accreditation, the value of accreditation, the assessment process, applying for accreditation, and then supporting your journey once you're on that route. So a little bit about UCAS. Um, we're not part of government. Accreditation is deemed a public authority activity, and UCAS works in the public interest. We are recognised and appointed by government to assess organisations providing services for certification, testing, inspection, calibration, validation and verification. We were founded in 1966 and UCAS resulted from a merger of NAMAS, which was the National Measurement of Accreditation Service, and the NACCB, which was the National Accreditation Council for Certification Bodies. Before that, NAMAS itself was the result of a merger of NATLAS and BSC, which was the um, two organisations that looked after accreditation at that time. Um, as said, we're not for profit organisation. We've got around 3,000 accredited customers and we perform around 32,500 assessment days per annum with 330 full time staff and still actively growing. Additionally, we do have access to over 700 independent technical assessors who help us on our way. This network of independent experts is massively important resource for UCAS as it allows us to deliver suitably robust assessments in a wide range of technical areas. We're currently actively recruiting for both full-time assessment managers and independent technical assessors across a number of areas, and you can view all vacancies in the career section of the UCAS website. UCAS is also, <clears throat> I've said, public authority activity, um, and 
were provided with this privilege and remit to undertake our national accreditation body status by the Department for Business and Trade. And we operate under a memorandum of understanding with the government to be able to perform this activity. Um, this slide is an illustration of the breadth and variety of governmental departments that we work with um, and other stakeholders, such as associations and professional bodies, in order to develop and deliver a robust accreditation service that adequately represents the growing and developing interests of the nation. To ensure that UCAS delivers an effective, technically competent and professional service, it makes sure that stakeholders' views, concerns and priorities taken into what their future hopes are are fed back into its strategic planning process through mechanisms like the Policy Advisory Forum and Council, as well as uh, technical advisory committees in a number of the areas that will provide accreditation to. This is supported by work with policymakers in government departments, agencies and regulators to explore how accreditation can be used to support that application of better risk-based outcome-focused policies. This is delivered through the, the policy advisory structure of the Forum and Council. But there may also be steering groups in certain areas to ensure we allow effective and efficient delivery of accreditation. Examples of this include healthcare steering group and a fourth industrial revolution steering group. So what is accreditation? And how does UGAS fit into the world of accreditation? So we accredit as said before, a number of different areas. As you can see from the symbols, each, each area has individual symbols which reflect what area they come from. So we've got calibration, inspection, testing, management systems, validation and verification amongst numerous others. So how does this work? We'll have a chain of accreditation. It's a global network where we deliver confidence in uncertain times. And the way we do this is through the pyramid I'm just about to pull up. Um, so we have a remit to provide a world of confidence in the product and services which the public relies upon. Accreditation also helps us to facilitate national and international trade in a way that gives confidence to both confidence, trust and assurance to the consumers, which ultimately use the products and services that are subject to accreditation worldwide. So UCAS delivers this assurance initially through demonstration as a national accreditation body status. As that, um, as we hold the national accreditation body status, we also have to go through peer review and evaluation against ISO 17011, which allows us to be the national accreditation body. The standard all national accreditation bodies throughout the world must meet. And the peer evaluation for ourselves is conducted by European Accreditation, um, International Accreditation Forum and the International Laboratory Accreditation. UCAS then performs, then assesses and performs capabilities and technical competence of bodies that provide services and products. This helps to determine organisational competence and conformance with agreed standards. This may also include how they meet regulatory, sector-specific and scheme requirements. This provides a layer of confidence that these accredited organisations meet expectations to support the trust and assurance of the products and service delivered to the public and relevant stakeholders. So, what is accreditation? It's the attestation and formal recognition by an accreditation body of the competence, impartiality and integrity of a conformity assessment body to perform a specific, specific task or activity to the relevant standard that they're seeking accreditation for. Conformity assessment body activities, as you can see over here, 
as I said, we look at a wide range of different standards, testing standards, calibration standards, certification standards. A conformity assessment body is a generic term that could, for example, as I said, be a certification body, um, a proficiency provider, an inspection company, etc. Specific standards are used for the purpose of accreditation, which assesses the applicant conformity assessment body's processes against the requirements of the standard. This is then further broken down into activities such as specific tests or type of inspections. Examples of conformity assessment might be COVID-19 tests in testing, passenger lifts in inspection, um, nine, ISO 9001 quality management system in, in certification, and in our verification and validation section, emissions trading scheme, for example, for greenhouse gas report verification. Um, the scope of credited activity can be very specific, as we've just seen. Um, but just because a laboratory is accredited for its competence and conformance, for example, testing a saliva sample for the presence of COVID-19, it does not also confer accreditation for testing other samples for any other types of virus until this is also assessed by an accreditation body and accreditation for that activity is also granted. So when an organisation organization applies, they need to tell us exactly what they're looking for for accreditation. And then once granted, these accredited activities are listed on the organisation schedule of accreditation. So we've got two definitions there for accreditation and certification. Whilst the, the terms are often used interchangeably and they are closely related, the very distinct steps on the quality assurance bladder. So accreditation performs an oversight role that underpins the quality, impartiality and competence of the certification and other conformity assessment activities process. Certification, however, is an audit of whether an organisation, product or individual conforms to the criteria laid out in recognised standard or scheme such as ISO 9001. So a certification body will be auditing the process and the systems of organisations who are wishing to gain certification, whereas UCAS and other accreditation bodies across the globe will check the checkers in effect. So we ensure that the certification bodies that we accredit are meeting their accreditation criteria and providing a service that can be relied upon. So what is the value of accreditation? What does accreditation offer? Many businesses and organisations such as government departments and other public sector schemes use accreditation status as a, selection, as a selection criteria when evaluating external services and supplies. As such, accreditation can offer a competitive edge against non-accredited customers. There's various schemes, sectors and industries um, that may even have mandatory requirements for service providers to be accredited before they're even able <clears throat> to be considered. With household and accreditation, some organisations may find that they're unable to provide or deliver key services in the UK or the wider market. Such examples of this are forensic services in the UK need to be accredited um, to ISO 17020 for scene of prime examination. I saw 17025 for fingerprint comparison, marks, enhancement, body fluid recovery, etc. And they're also reviewed against the Forensic Science Regulators Code of Practice. Another example, the control of asbestos regulations 2012 needs to be accredited against 17025 and reviewed against an approved code of practice and guidance. Screening services such as healthcare. Um, for infectious diseases in pregnancy must be accredited as part of the government requirements. Accreditation is a measure of the quality in the delivery of the service and this demonstrates that the organisation's commitment to all stakeholders, including its staff, that it focuses on the best outcome and improvements in that service. During the accreditation, 
<coughs> process through assessment, a conformity assessment body must demonstrate sufficient ability to evaluate and manage risk. This can support an organisation's assurance of this for its customers and clients through dynamic management of risk. Based on a survey of UCAS's customers and stakeholders, there was a heavy majority of responders that stated accreditation did a number of things for them. It provided confidence in its service delivery. It improved the quality and validity of its work. It helped differentiate, it, differentiate its services from other services. And it provided procurement advantages over like-for-like -like competitors. Um, so UCAS, as we said, um, underpins the UK and global quality infrastructure um, by allowing efficiency and validity, accuracy, innovation, competence, impartiality, advantages, as we've already explained, and international acceptance. Our aim is that everything should be underpinned by accreditation. Got mutual recognition equivalence. As I said, if you were accredited, it's internationally recognised. Accreditation is part of an international network to ensure equivalence and acceptance of results. It aims to remove technical barriers to trade. Tested, inspected or certified once, accepted everywhere is the rules that international accreditation applies. There are mutual recognition agreements at two different levels. Technical recognition between accreditation bodies. The purposes of these agreements is to allow the accredited conformity assessment of signatories of the multilateral agreement to be recognised by other members of the international accreditation world. Hence the acceptance of products and services across national borders. This is based upon peer evaluation and continued surveillance to the national accreditation body standard ISO 17011. All signatories to the agreement must be declared competent accreditation bodies. EA members must also be compliant with the principles of the EU accreditation regulation. There's then also bilateral agreements between states. And the objective is to promote trade in goods between nations by facilitating market access and aims to benefit industry by providing easier access to conformity assessment. Mm -hmm. So UCAS is the United Kingdom member of a number of accreditation committees. The International Accreditation Forum, the European Cooperation for Accreditation and the International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation. So over the next few slides, I'll outline key parts in the assessment process and how that process should hopefully end with the accreditation of the organisation seeking accreditation. So the first stage is preparation. So UCAS expects potential applicants that are coming their way to have implemented an active management system that demonstrates the following evidence, including, but not limited to, suitable coverage of internal audits, robust complaints handling and management of non-conforming work, effective implementation of corrective and preventive actions, active engagement with users, customers and clients with objective demonstration of feedback and outcomes from those clients. There may be other aspects as required by your relevant standard that you are looking to apply for and any scheme framework requirements outlined should you be wanting accreditation or certification towards schemes. Um, these requirements will be outlined in documents, standards or publica publications relevant to the area of accreditation you're looking for. And we would expect the organisation coming for assessment for application to have some level of awareness of these elements. Some signposts of the publications that we're talking about will be outlined in the application process later. 
So the next stage is pre-assessment. So once once you've decided you're in a position to, to come forward and apply, um, your application is accepted by UCAS, you'll then be assigned a dedicated assessment manager, otherwise termed EM, who will support and guide you through the accreditation process from here on out. As part of this process, the assessment manager will propose an optional preliminary pre-assessment. This is highly recommended um, and we do ask that you consider it and it's especially useful if you're new to UCAS accreditation. That pre-assessment will usually involve some form of on-site activity assess uh, assessment of activities performed with a combination of documentation review ahead of the assessment and potentially some remote review of your systems or interviewing of people with key responsibilities. The pre-assessments are a great way to highlight areas of conformance and outline gaps that may exist to allow you to iron out potential problems um, and identify any potential showstoppers, as we call them, that could prevent you from gaining accreditation if you were to go straight to initial assessment. Just as importantly, it will help you understand the accreditation process and what to expect on initial assessment. This is the stage at which an applicant begins to develop their relationship with your UCAS personnel and to become familiar with the UCAS assessment processes overall. The pre-assessment wouldn't raise any findings, but would provide you with an overview of your management system and activities applied for that would need to be addressed before initial assessment can take place. So the initial assessment, this is where we would come on site, um, having reviewed pre-documentation beforehand, would provide you with a visit plan as to how we were going to go about assessing all of the activities and or sites um, that you have applied for accreditation for. Um, the team would come along with your assessment manager slash lead assessor, who would usually fulfill the role of assessing your quality management system. And we would also bring either technical assessors or technical experts along with us who have the expertise in the area that you were looking to gain accreditation of. The assessment would take place over a number of days and would cover all aspects of the service that you're looking to get accredited. Um, we'll do that through witnessing of tests, um, document review, interviewing of staff members, um, record review, going back looking at historical records and, and reports, etc. And during that initial assessment, a recommendation is reached. And that recommendation at the end of assessment will either be that, yes, you are in a, a position where we can recommend accreditation to you, based on the close out of any findings that may have been raised, or no, the organisation isn't quite ready yet, and we would then have discussions about timelines um, or showstopper areas that were mentioned earlier, which are critical findings that would have to be addressed before we could offer accreditation. So, assuming that you were successful and you were recommended accreditation for your applied for scope. Um, <clears throat> there's a process to be followed. First, you'll be sent an offer of accreditation letter and a draft copy of what your schedule of accreditation will look like, and also an estimate of the assessment days required for ongoing accreditation process known as the four-year cycle. To continue with your grant of accreditation, you'll need to review your draft schedule and ensure it's got all the areas on that you applied for um, in as, as clear as terms as possible. And at the, um, sign the form at the end of the offer of accreditation letter, sign date and return to UCAS, which saying you accept the offer that is in the letter and the terms um, that go alongside it. If required, any outstanding fees would need to be paid before accreditation was granted. Once all the documentation is received and the recommendations are accepted, 
and the review of the initial assessment process has gone through an independent decision maker who reviews the depth um, and the, the, the kind of the accreditation process and assessment that you underwent covers all areas of your applied for scope. UCAS can then grant accreditation and the four year cycle would commence. You'll receive at that point a grant of accreditation letter and a verifiable accreditation e-certificate, which can then be scanned by any clients and provide them with confidence in your, your accreditation and protect your accreditation status. A schedule of accreditation, which is the list of the scope of your accredited activities, would then be uploaded to the UCAS website to allow any prospective clients to view when they're evaluating and selecting services in a certain area. You also receive the relevant symbols, you know, going back to the symbols I sent earlier, where there was um, a certification symbol and a testing symbol and a validation symbol. You receive access to the use of those symbols um, in your work. However, there's very strict conditions under which the, the symbols and the marks and the logos can be used. And there is a policy on the UCAS website that explains to new customers how those can be applied. Right, so ongoing assessment. As we said, the, the process is a four year cycle. Um, so you have your grant of accreditation. Six months post grant, you will have your first surveillance. And then that month that you have your first surveillance, in subsequent years in that month, you will have surveillance two, surveillance three, and then reassessment. Reassessment is the process where we come in and we look at all your processes again, check they're still compliant and conform with the standard that you see that you were accredited for, and then we will renew your accreditation should everything still be satisfactory, and the the cycle, the four year cycle, will begin again. So just an overview. Um, in, in kind of pictorial form, if you like, of the accreditation process. So as we said, there's the application, um, where there's any inquiries, discussion of fees, processing of the application and preparation for the assessment. There's then contract review, where your assessment manager will discuss with yourself um, what the assessment approach will look like, what efforts needed to allow us to choose the team which sites we're going to be looking at, what activities we're going to be looking at, to assure that we get the team that's right for your, your assessment. There's then the pre-assessment where applicable if a customer chooses to have one. That can be either on-site or via desktop assessment. And the customer can choose in discussion with your assessment manager how you'll get the best use of that pre-assessment. As I said, you then have the initial assessment which includes the open and meeting, any interviews with users or managers, record reviews, vertical and horizontal assessments, witness activities, full report and a recommendation in that closing meeting at the end of the assessment. You then go through the decision making process and grant or renewal, and then continuous quality improvement, which as I said, surveillance in year one, year two, year three, and then reassessment in year four. So how do you get started in applying for accreditation? You must familiarise with the clauses in the relevant accreditation um, standard that you were seeking accreditation in. You've got to be aware of the potential impacts on your service um, by trying to conform to this standard. Standards can be purchased from sources just such as BSI, which is the British Standard Institute, or ISO, which is the International Standards Organization. Some standards that we assess to are freely available, such as the, the IQIPS, Improving Quality and Vision Physiological Sciences Standards. You'll then need to undertake a gap analysis on the current provision of your service against the standard you wish to apply for. We require this to ensure that you are ready to fulfil the accreditation requirements and that we 
don't deliver an assessment that you're unable to complete because there's big gaps in your system. The UCAS website has links to various mandatory publications, um, such as technical policy statements, technical bulletins, that will, be, will need to be designed into your system to ensure conformance. So not only do you have to conform with the standard, but you also have to conform with UCAS publications that support accreditation. Depending on the type of service, that you're looking to seek accreditation for. There may be further scheme or sector requirements that you'll need to be aware of and build appropriately into your process and services as required. There may also be international requirements, again, depending on the, the accreditation you seek. And you've also got to be aware of any international publications from the three international accreditation bodies. Um, and their websites have those publications that may be applicable. Once in the application process, obviously, you'll be assigned at EM and they should be able to sign post you to the required documents for your accreditation process. Mm -hmm. You then need to complete all the relevant application forms relevant to your sector that you're seeking accreditation in. Ensuring documentation is double checked prior to submission. Um, it's always best if it's kind of a, um, a committee that looks at this application to ensure everything's on there and nothing's overlooked. <clears throat> this is to ensure that all mandate requirements are fulfilled and prevent delay in the accreditation process. So we don't turn up thinking we're assessing one set of areas and, and find out you've actually got something else that you'd like us to look at as well. Submitting documentation would include the application form, the accreditation category you're looking for accreditation in. Um, this application form is more commonly known as the EAC form and there'll be supporting documents as outlined and relevant to your sector. A signed agreement um, is required to confirm your, confirm your adherence to the terms and conditions you cast set out um, and a fees required at application stage to allow us to process the application. Once accepted, financial checks will be completed and you'll then be assigned assessment manager who will contact you regarding your application um, and discuss the composition of your organisation, who's involved, etc. The submitted documents that it come through and whether any information is needed at this stage to progress your application to the assessment stage. It's also a perfect opportunity at this stage to raise questions on the assessment process, which will support your preparation and also discuss your pre-assessment options. Um, and this will all be through support and guidance from your assessment manager. So through the support in your journey, obviously UCAS support their applicants through the entire process. If you'd like to find out more about how to ready your organisation to and to find out how close you are to being able to proceed with accreditation, there's a number of resources available. So UCAS has developed a suite of readiness assessment tools. And these are self-assessment tools that are designed to support conformity assessment bodies operating against a range of sectors on their journey to achieving UCAS accreditation. There's currently self-assessment tools available for 17025 for test and calibration, 15189 for medical laboratories, 17021 for management systems, 17065 for product process service certification bodies, IQIPS for the physiological services and BS70,000 for the accreditation of medical physics and clinical engineering and diagnostic images. The self-assessment tool has a set of questions which are designed to allow organisations to check their current policies and systems against the expectations of each standard. Against each criteria, the three potential responses, either yes, we're ready, no, were not and somewhat ready, um, which organisations can use to describe how closely they meet the requirements of the standard they're looking to, <coughs> to seek accreditation in. 
The readiness assessment is best completed by individuals who have a good un understanding of how their organisation manages and performs its technical activities and are responsible for aspects of quality and customer management. So to help in your journey, you should identify the relevant support in UCAS publications, which will be required to gain accreditation. International publications, as we said, relevant to your area, are also available on the EA, IEF and ILAC websites. All support and publication and technical content can be found on the UCAS website, where you can also sign up to receive monthly updates to any publications that may have been updated or new publications. Um, also, there's information included on various standards that might be out for consultation or indeed have been withdrawn. Also, there is the UCAS Training Academy <clears throat> that UCAS provides. And whilst training is not a mandatory requirement for gaining accreditation, it can be useful in enhancing the knowledge of some of the more complex areas of the standard or providing the tools and techniques to fill in the remaining gaps in knowledge in your organisation and ensure that your systems and processes are developed in line with the requirements for accreditation. The UCAS Academy offers both digital learning and face-to-face -face learning and courses are available in the areas stated on screen that cover most of the areas that we accredit. Um, UCAS Accredit Academy trainers are also either current or previous senior assessment managers within the areas that the courses are being delivered. So there's an opportunity at that stage to ask specific questions in relation to the standard, but note at this stage not specific to your organisation because UCAS can't provide a consultancy status. Training um, can also be offered whereby we would come to your company premise as well if there was a large enough number seeking the training for that to be an option. Right, at this stage we will look at the questions. So we'll move on to our question and answer session. Um, so any further questions you might want answering now if you can drop them into the section. Um, and everything we've discussed and any queries we don't get to address in this session will be transcribed into frequently asked questions and you'll be able to review this after the webinar. And at this stage, I'd just thank, like to thank you all for listening um, to the session on demystifying accreditation and I'll hand over to Laura. All right. Thanks, Crystal. Thank you. That was a really good overview of everything. Really appreciate going into all the detail. Um, we have had um, some questions that have come through. Um, this one's interesting. Somebody's asked what the benefits of flexible flexible scope is. I'm wondering if you could give a bit of information about how that helps an organisation seeking accreditation. Yeah. So once an accredit once the organisation's been accredited and they've been accredited for enough time for UCAS to gain assurances of their their processes, um, an organisation can seek flexible scope for certain areas. Now when we say flexible scope, we don't mean flexible scope whereby you can bring in any testing activity, any kind of inspection activity, um as an accredited organisation, the flexible scope must be brought in in a particular area. Um, now, the flexible scope is given by UCAS based on the organisation's ability to bring on board new areas and um, activities that are very like things that are already accredited to. So Louise, I think Louise is in the background. Louise is the development section head, manager of all development, um, and she'll be able to further explain this, the flexible score process. Yep, lovely, thank you. It's a great question. Um, flexible scopes are applied across the business, so it's not just uh, traditionally in testing where they started, um, but they can be offered to any organization who can demonstrate that they have the competence and ability to 
um, where something has changed within um, a very specific set of boundaries. So it may be a certain type of testing or a certain certification activity, certain inspection activity that they can um, increase or change their scope. And that allows them to do so without having to come through the formal extension scope process. So in that case, um, they need to let us know that they, that they have uh, completed that and we will review the um, process with them at their annual surveillance. But it gives them the opportunity to be able to react quickly to the market. So traditionally, this is seen as being very, um, very, very beneficial for areas such as allergen testing or pesticide testing, uh, where, where market changes and there needs to be a very quick response to, to changes in legislation or regulation. Clearly, there are uh, competence issues, so we have to be comfortable that the organisation itself is able to validate a new method or validate a new process um, and be able to apply it and um, sort of evaluate its own performance and identify if, if everything is OK or not. Um, and that comes with a risk of its own. So it allows you to get ahead of the curve and um, call something accredited before we've looked at it. However, you run the risk that when we do look at it, if things have not been done as would be required and a suitable robust assessment um, and process has not been completed, then that would need to be uh, remedied very quickly. Um, we accredit organisations to have a flexible scope on a very specific basis. So, as I've said, certain tests, certain parameters, certain matrices using perhaps certain equipment or a certification of a certain activity using a certain uh, process with the flexibilities built in. So we don't say you can do anything, that's fine, off you go. Just let us know. It's still very, very um, uh, sort of managed so that we can be sure that, that that technical area is covered. And then of course you can change it or increase it and, and do so as, as would need to be for your um, for your organisation. So the benefits are it allows you to respond quickly um, and not wait to go through the full extension scope process on each and every change that you might make to a model um, or, or a method. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, we've got a couple more questions relating to flexible, flexible scopes, so I'm just going to stick on topic for a second. Um, somebody else has asked, with, uh, with regards to flexible scope, would we be able to do this for immunocytochemistry so that we can add new antibodies without having to do an extension to scope? Yes, absolutely. So th this is one of the key areas where the flexible scope is really, really useful. So you might have one test and platform, for example, immunocytochemistry, where you can have 200 different tests that are performed on that one analyzer. They're all performed in exactly the same way. They just look for different antigens. Now, the process is exactly the same and the competence required is exactly the same for that process. So what we would do is we would come in and we would assure ourselves that the competence of the staff performing the activity could verify new antigens that were being put on that analyzer and we work up the test, check the QCs, check everything that's required to ensure that the quality of the new test they're looking to introduce on that analyzer is exactly the same as all the tests that already hold accreditation for. If that was the case, and we were assured of this competence, we would then give them a flexible scope for the analyzer. Now, so whatever test, they wish to perform on that analyzer, assuming the measurement principle is exactly the same, we would we would allow them to, to work up themselves and then offer as an accredited activity. Does that answer the Absolutely. question? Yeah. It's a perfect example, actually, isn't it? It is. Of, of where we would use it. Yeah. Absolutely. Another good example is in allergy testing. You know, we would accredit the analyzer, even though there can be thousands of allergens. And rather than have to name them all and apply for an extension to scope each time a manufacturer adds a new 
allergen to a panel, we would give a flexible scope for the allergen panel so that everything would be covered as and when required. Thank you very much. Um, we've had one more question regarding flexible scope. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question, so I'm going to read it out verbatim and um, hopefully you two ladies will be able to help. Um, can a proposal be made for consideration by UCAS regarding flexible scope against a number of protocols within a series? And can this be constrained against UCAS's decision? Louise. Yeah, I'm struggling to understand the question as well. Can a proposal be made for consideration but regarding under a number of protocols within a series? If you're asking if the protocols within a flexible scope um, framework could, the, if the protocols themselves could be changed, then possibly we would need to have a look at that and see what the extent and 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 what that really looks like. But um, there's no reason why it couldn't be different protocols contained within the field of flexibility. But we would need to discuss that specifically. I think with you, um, I haven't got a name there. So um, if you want to drop us an email we can uh, arrange a chat and discuss that with you specifically. Yeah, actually, um, on that, the email address is on the screen here. Um, if you okay. have um, general questions, the, the best place for first inquiries, potentially questions like that, could be communications at ucas.com. That comes into myself and the rest of the team, but we will then be able yeah. to make sure they reach an appropriate um, technical person at UCAS. Um, actually, one more question on flex flexible scope today. Um, what is the, the cost of securing a flexible scope? Same as yeah. another full assessment, question mark? It's the same as another extension to scope. So what we would be looking at here is your ability um, to perform that evaluation process yourself. So how you would plan increasing your activities to include, as, as um, Crystal said, either another allergen or another um another element or, or whatever that would be within your testing so it would be how we would assess that so we would be looking at your competency your validation processes your flexible scope management process um so it's probably going to be a day or two on site we would be need to look, be looking at your organization to make sure you've got the competency to do that um those records uh competency records um as well as worked example, we're going to need something to say this is and this is one we've done that we can look at and say, yeah, you've got everything covered. You followed your process and we can do that. So it's exactly the same as an extension to scope process, just a slightly different angle for that as well. It's probably worth pointing out it would be quite unusual for us to grant um, an extension, um, a flexible scope if either the methodology, the ex, um, the equipment being used or the activity is not already accredited. So if you're, if, say you've got a suite of allergens already on your schedule and you're looking to go flexible so you can add more, then that's absolutely fine. But if you had no, no uh, allergens on there at all to start off with, we'd probably want to see you starting off at the beginning and do the more formal traditional process of extension scope but uh, it would be handled as, as an extension. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on from flexible scopes now, and uh, we do have some other questions as well. Um, somebody has asked, does UCAS accredit or does the UCAS accreditation process cover aerodrome technical and operational systems and associated technical training? I don't think we've done anything around aerodromes. We do an awful lot in the aerospace and mm -hmm. industry particularly aerospace management systems. But in terms of the aerodromes themselves specifically, not that I'm aware of. I've had a quick look and I can't see anything that, mm -hmm. that would fit into that, that sector. Um, so if you'd like to have a discussion about that, then we're, we're very um, happy to have that um, and see if it's something we could extend. Whether you already have um, things like 9001 certification within your sector um, that is, is accredited by us, that might be something that you already do. You might already do environmental management or, or things like that. But in terms of a technical um, requirements for aerodromes specifically, it's not something that I'm aware of as yet. Thank you. Um, 
So still got a few questions to get through. Um, someone has asked, is there a readiness assessment tool for transitioning from 2012 to 2022 standards? I, I know there definitely isn't a tool specifically with that in mind, um, but Louise and Crystal may well know, um, I'm assuming that the readiness assessment tools do cover um, recent transitions, do they? For instance, the 15189 one will do, won't it? Yeah, so the 15189 one does consider the transitions, mm. um, but the best thing for seeing if you're ready for the transition is the gap analysis on the UCAS website yeah. so there's a transition area on the UCAS website and there's obviously we have a number of transitions taking place but if you search for 15189 transition and there's a gap analysis on there and there's also a lot of documentation on there which will help you in your transition process um, I, the readiness assessment tools tend to be based on on a new initial assessment, if you like, so starting from scratch. So the transition on the website is is probably the best place to look. Sure, and um, we do obviously have a range of courses aimed to support businesses in that process as well, I should also say. Um, someone else has asked, moving on again, is it mandatory to use the UCAS symbol if you are accredited, for example, reports of PT schemes that go to participants, etc.? So is it mandatory to use the symbol? It's not in all cases. There are some specific areas, um, calibration uh, requirements. Um, it's slightly different, um, but no, it's not mandatory to use it. Our, I mean, our, our comment would be, if you're going to go to all the work to get credited, then you want to shout it from the rooftop. So um, so why wouldn't you want to use it? But some sectors, it's, it's just not, um, is not needed to be on, on reports. So it's up to you apart from some very specific areas, um, which are, are, are not widespread. Um, thank you. Um, we've got one here. Um, can an ILAC MRA signatory issue accreditation on top of the accreditation already granted by another accreditation body? That is also a signatory to the same MRA. Yeah, that's absolutely possible. And we do that um, in a certain number of areas. Tends to be where it's regarding exports or imports, um, where perhaps one country would require or a certain organisation or, or body would require accreditation from a certain group. But yes, we can do it. Um, it would beg the question why, um, because they should be recognised across across borders. That's the whole point of the, of the MLA. Mm -hmm. But it does happen and for very specific reasons and it is able to be done. Thank you. Um, we often get these sorts of questions. I can I think a, a typically UCAS answer might be forthcoming, but somebody has asked, what's the typical timeline for the entire assessment process from preparation to the grant of, of what accreditation? Yeah, that's a nice long time frame with a lot of ifs and buts and it depends included in there. When we're asked that question, and particularly within our team within development, that where we're looking at new accreditations, it's a question we're asked all the time. It very much depends on how ready you are to proceed. So um, are you already actively working in that area? Have you got your procedures and the methods and staff competencies? Have you got customers? Are you actually doing the work? Or is it something you're thinking, right, we want to get into this market, where do we start? Um, if you're already accredited and it's another test that you're adding on, um, clearly that would be a quicker progress uh, as well. But if you're starting right from scratch, then the process might take you anywhere between 6 to 12, 18, two years, months, um, as, it, as it were, literally depending on your readiness to proceed and your ability and your resources to throw at it to make it happen. Um, and we see we see all 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 varieties within that time scale where someone will come to us and say, you need to be accredited super quick, we've got it ready and we'll work with you and get that done. Others it's development and um might not be a quality system included or a management system that needs to be developed as well. So it really does depend, I'm afraid, on on where you are. But typically you can say perhaps six months to, to 24 months is it would be reasonable. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've got one final question. So if anyone does have anything they want to ask, if they could drop it in the Q&A now, that'd be fantastic. Um, somebody has asked, as part of assessment, how do you cast test? And is there a sampling approach? 
again i'm assuming it depends might might fall into this que this question as well in terms of what what the test actually is and but uh, yeah could you give us a little bit more um, information on that perhaps Mr. yeah yeah so obviously on your application you should state exactly what you want us to look at <clears throat> and what we do is at initial assessment we need to ensure that we witness and see the documentation involved with every area of activity on that application form. We can't offer accreditation on something we haven't seen. Once we've seen everything and you are offered accreditation, in the subsequent cycle, we split your entire score of accreditation into bite-sized chunks so that over the four-year cycle, we see your entire scope again, mm -hmm. if you like. So we'll take a quarter, mm -hmm. of, a quarter of your scope each year and, and we'll look at them. Again, there's different ways to do this, depending on what works best for your site. We, we can choose a measurement principle each year. Um, we can choose um, your, <clears throat> your testing material. So we might choose kind of tissues one year and blood another year and and all things like this but what the way we do it is we, we plan to relook at your entire accredited score over the, the duration of the four-year cycle but the initial assessment yes we would need to see every site and every activity performed um now if activities were put, performed in exactly the same way on exactly the same analyzer across multiple sites what we would do is take a selection of those sites. Wouldn't look at it on every site all over again. Would look at the documentation. Would look at the competence records. Would look at the facilities. So we're we're taking an approach um, that uses the time wisely to ensure we collect all the information necessary to offer accreditation in that that particular area. Great. We are at the end of our questions then. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to attend today as well. Um, a few people have asked um, if they can get copies of the webinar. We um, we have recorded it. Um, I'll be sending this round via email um, at the start of next week, week, Monday or Tuesday next week. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much to Crystal and Louise for their time today for a brilliant um, overview presentation um, and a very, very comprehensive, engaging Q&A. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. I'll um, I'll close the close the webinar at that point. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye.